Um, so I'm Ben Ehrman. I'm the Colorado Avian Health Program Specialist at CSU. Um, Emily, who's also here today, she is one of our veterinary students who is helping us this year. And she also helped us last year with all of our testing and various other things that we do throughout the year. Um, so what is it that we do? Uh, so we do health checks at shows and fairs, which aren't happening right now, which is a huge bummer. Um, so made our workload a little bit different this year right now. Um, we also do a lot of testing. So a lot of the avian influenza tests that are coming through, as well as a lot of other diseases, we help with testing on that element. We run the National Poultry Improvement Plan, um, which if you are part of that, we'll come to your flock and we do testing and we check out the birds and it just helps with people who ship birds over state lines, whether it be eggs or live birds or show birds, whatever it may be. Um, sometimes we do investigate sick flocks if people have something going on that they don't know. Sometimes that's us right now. A lot of it is through the state vet. They actually go do a lot of stuff like that right now, or have agents who come out to people. And then we do a lot of education and outreach. So things like this, talking to 4-H people, um, as well as, you know, commercial producers and stuff like that. Um, so first thing we're going to talk about is some high path stuff. Um, so highly pathogenic avian influenza is, plaguing the country right now. Um, this, I, it's a lot of words, a lot of numbers, is just over the past couple of days, um, a lot of states that have posted about what birds have been affected in their states. Um, so as you can see, there are a lot of small numbers for backyard flocks, and then there's some commercial ones that are in the hundreds, even the millions. Um, you can see on the right side, there is the Colorado one that was recent. Um, very unfortunate they got hit, but you know, you push past it. There's the Nebraska one, also a big one. Um, you can find all this information on USDA and AVIS's website. They have really good maps and good information. Um, a lot of cool resources to help you follow and track what's going on in the country right now with this. Um, here is a map of what is going on. Uh, it shows all the green is the wild bird cases. So those are kind of spread out all through the country. Yellow is backyard cases that have been reported. And then red are the commercial operations. So birds that are in the hundreds to millions of thousands. Um, it even spans all the way up into Alaska. They had one pretty recently. Um, Colorado, unfortunately, we've had a couple more just pop up and not fun to deal with right now, but it's spread out all the country and hopefully it starts ending soon. That's the hope since migration is kind of slowing down. Um, but it's anyone's guess because some, sometimes it's in the birds who stay resident here, whether it's geese or ducks. Um, it tends to travel with the wild migrating waterfowl um, and then it gets into the chickens and that's when it becomes an epidemic plague. Um, and you can see the numbers. It's, you know, over 290 cases in the US, 34 states affected, over 37 million birds have been affected and all of which unfortunately have died or have been euthanized to prevent the spread. Um, so just kind of what flock owners can do. Um, the biggest thing with uh, avian influenza is increasing biosecurity. So if you have the means to keep the birds in a secure location where they can't interact with wild birds, monitor their time outdoors that you can, um, you wanna monitor their eating and their drinking. Um, a lot of people, sometimes they think they have fresh water and stuff and maybe they don't have access and that could be causing problems. And sometimes they're just not drinking. So it's stuff you always wanna to check to where you wanna make sure if they have water, make sure they are drinking it, make sure they are eating. Um, those can be signs of AIs if they're not laying eggs, they're not acting normal. Um, so you wanna make sure you monitor how the flock is behaving, course biosecurity, um, and then report anything that seems unusual. Um, a lot of diseases are similar. Unfortunately, avian influenza is if you have more than three birds die in a weekend, basically, that that's a cause for concern. If you have one bird die every two weeks, you probably have something else going on. Um, but we're happy to walk people through if they call us or the uh, CDA, the Colorado Department of Agriculture. Um, they can usually help put people's mind at ease, whether it is avian influenza or something else going on in the flock. 
Um, so we're going to kind of start with just poultry health, signs of sickness, common illnesses, um, and go through that. So main thing you want to ask yourself is like, how do you even know if your birds are sick? Because a lot of times it's really hard to tell. And we get calls all the time where people are like, yeah, they're acting pretty normal. And it's, it's really hard to tell with birds, it's hard to tell what their signs are. Um, but a lot of times it's kind of similar to us. So you want to look at your bird when you go to the coops every day. You want to see, are they losing feathers? Are they losing weight? Um, are they moving around? Are they making sounds? Um, are they, you know, acting how you normally see your chickens? Are they eating, drinking, running? Are you able to catch them with ease? You know, sometimes that can be something to look for. Anything that looks a little unusual probably is cause for concern. Um, next thing you want to do is listen to the birds. Like I kind of said, you know, if they're making kind of a gurgling sound, maybe that could be something bad. If they're not making any sounds, that could be something that, you know, could be concerning. Are they acting just anything out of the ordinary? Uh, next thing is smell. So a lot of problems can be related to indigestion. So whether it's a really high urine smell or maybe there smells like diarrhea in the coop, something that isn't normal smell. If you have clean litter, clean water, um, it should smell how you'd expect your coop to smell, I guess, if you clean it regularly. Anything that causes you to make a reaction when you walk in that coop, that's something that should catch your eye. Um, and then filling your birds. You definitely want to, every time you go into the coop, pick one chicken up, pick two chickens up, see how they feel. You should get a sense of a good weight for your birds. Um, how much, how their feathers feel. They should be soft and fluffy. You don't want them crunchy. That could be a sign of bugs. A lot of different things that can go wrong. And so it's always good to feel what a healthy chicken looks, feels like versus what, if they have something going wrong, maybe they're not eating, maybe they're not drinking, maybe they have bugs, a lot of different things. Um, maybe they're cold, maybe they're not moving. A lot of things can cause concern. Um, so we always say to pick up the birds and get up and close to personal is because birds don't always look sick. Um, so this picture right here, you'll see a bunch of turkeys. They're all on the perches. They're walking around, they're moving, eyes open. Looks like a really healthy flock. But if you get a little bit closer, you'll see a bird like this has swollen nasals, glossed over eyes, some goop kind of running out of the eyes, maybe a little goop coming out of the nose. This bird has some stuff stuck to its beak, which is usually a sign of nasal discharge. Um, if it's just water, stuff usually will slough off really easily. Beaks aren't normally sticky. So if you see stuff stuck to the face, that's usually a sign they have some nasal discharge, some boogers, um, some more swelling on this bird. This in the back of the throat, you can see these kind of lesions, these, this plaque built up on the beak. That's usually a sign of ILT, uh, infectious laryngotracheitis. Um, so even stuff like that, you want to look inside the bird's mouth, you know, see what that looks like. You should get yourself familiar with the bird's anatomy, um, you know, at least outwardly. We're not going to tell you to open one up and see on the inside too much other than like inside the mouth, you know, because this is a very serious disease. And if you see something like that, you want to catch it early before it gets really bad. This next one, you can see it's a lot of really intense swelling on the bird's face. Um, stuff that you just might not catch if you just peek your head in, fill up the water, and then move on your way. So it's more general signs of illness. Um, lethargy, that's always a big one. If the bird's not happy to go get treats or happy to go get food, um, not running around, it's, you know, maybe doesn't even move when you go and try and pick it up. That's a big sign of a lot of diseases. Not laying eggs. Uh, if their egg production drops all of a sudden, haven't laid an egg in a week, and it's not that time of year, then it's definitely a cause for concern. Respiratory things, sneezing, coughing, anything like that, open mouth breathing, similar signs to humans can always be cause for concern. Um, and then other things like lesions, diarrhea, anything that doesn't seem right is something that should catch your eye on these birds. So we're going to go through some common poultry diseases that we hear a lot about, we see a lot. So Merix. Merix is one of the most heartbreaking ones that I feel like we see. It's very, very, very common nowadays. It was once thought to be kind of gone. 
um, when everything was kind of commercial operations, but then people started getting backyard flocks and it kind of came back because it's harder to monitor. Um, it is a viral cancer. It's a herpes cancer or a herpes disease. Um, it's very hardy in the environment. It sticks around a feather dander, dust, the walls of your coop. Uh, it can stick around for months without even a bird around. It's really, really hard to get rid of. It causes paralysis, um, neurological signs. It can cause internal issues. It comes in a lot of different things, um, but there's no treatment for it. Unfortunately, birds will usually either die from it or go so far to as they should probably be euthanized. Um, the only way to treat it is basically vaccinate. You have to vaccinate these birds either day of hatch or in ovo. So while they're in the egg and most places that sell these birds will do that properly, but there are a lot of ones who don't vaccinate properly and they'll vaccinate maybe a week after they hatch. And it brings down the, the lot or the effectiveness of the vaccine from, I think it's like, it's a really high number. And then if you don't do it right, it goes down to like 50% chance and then they can still get the diseases. Um, the next one is Mycoplasma galaseptica and synoviae. So MG and MS. This is a really chronic, highly pathogenic disease. It's a chronic respiratory disease. It is treatable, but isn't curable. So once it gets in your flock, it is there to stay. Um, causes the nasal swelling, the eye discharge. And a lot of times people don't necessarily know they have it, especially in chickens, and it can kind of stay dormant in their systems. And then you take the bird to a show or you give it to a friend for a weekend to watch them. Um, and that kind of stress will present the disease and then your bird just gave it to everyone else because you were unaware that it had the disease. Um, so that's a really tough one. And then it's also tough because the chickens can have it sometimes kind of relatively harmoniously and they can give it to turkeys and turkeys will show more morbidity or mortality with the disease. Um, and it can cause a lot of problems. So it, it causes other issues if you have different types of birds together and you don't know that you have these diseases. The next one is the infectious laryngotracheitis, ILT. So we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier with the, the plaque, the lesions in the mouth. You can see on this bird right here, it has a huge plaque uh, on the beak. Uh, this disease is high mortality. It is another respiratory disease like a lot of poultry diseases. It's another herpes virus. So it's no tr there's no treatment. It's not curable. Um, most poultry typically die from this. It starts in their system and then it kind of slowly works its way up and that's when you start to see this plaque in the mouth um, and so that's a tough one to deal with the next one is salmonella um, this one is super common i'm sure all of you heard of it it is a zoonotic disease which means humans can get it um, most chickens carry salmonella so that's really tricky and that's why they always say never to eat raw chicken or raw eggs um, that's an easy way to get it another way to get salmonella transferred to yourself is by kissing chickens or not washing your hands after dealing with chickens. So if you go and deal with other chickens and then go eat a sandwich, you could potentially give yourself salmonella and that causes intestinal problems and diarrhea and puking, um, not fun stuff. So definitely want to always wash your hands and stuff when you're handling chickens. Um, less common ones, but very scary are avian influenza. These are the big poultry diseases, even influenza, obviously it's going around the country right now, high mortality, another respiratory disease. It is zoonotic, so it can be transmitted to humans. Luckily, we haven't had too much of that this year. Um, it's mostly stayed in the birds, so that's always a good sign. But a lot of the signs for avian influenza, you know, stop eating and drinking. They'll get purplish on the comb sometimes. Sometimes it'll cause paralysis. The birds typically, once they show their first sign, will die within 24 to 48 hours. Um, and then after that, you know, bird after bird after bird will die. These big poultry operations, they'll see maybe 100 die one day and then 1,000 the next day. And then over the weekend, they'll lose the whole, you know, 100,000 birds. Um, so really scary disease, really bad, hard to manage. Um, comes over on waterfowl and stuff like that and gets into the chickens and the waterfowl can live with it harmoniously. And so it's a really tough one to track. The next thing is Newcastle's disease. Uh, it's another respiratory, of course, as all of them are. 
Um, it's a nervous, it hangs out in nervous systems of birds. There was an outbreak a couple of years ago in California, Utah, but it didn't really come up much. They squashed it pretty quickly. Um, it causes lethargy and stuff in chickens. It is more prevalent in the Eurasian continents. Um, so we don't really see it right now in the U S but we do test for it all the time. The next thing is Salmonella pylorum typhoid. So this disease we test for constantly with the MPIP. The reason for this is back in, I believe it's the thirties. Um, it went around the poultry industry, killed off 90 or so percent of birds in the country, high mortality. And that's why they created the MPIP program to test for this. And since then, it has basically been eradicated, partially due to the constant testing of this disease. And we make sure it never comes back because it's so deadly. Um, so next thing, you know, we talked about the diseases. Now we kind of talk about how we test for these diseases. So easiest way is your swabbing. That's how we typically test for avian influenza. Um, a little bit more intimate, you can do the serum or blood. This is how you can test for different things like pleurum typhoid or avian influenza. Again, that's another way to test for if you do a different kind of tests. The best uh, way to know what's going on with your chicken is necropsy. So if a bird dies, you bring it into a vet hospital or you know something like CSU, we will have someone specialized to open up the bird, see what's going wrong, and they can tell you almost anything that happened to the bird if they get it soon enough. Um, and then obviously veterinary assist assessment. So if you have something going wrong with the chicken, maybe it's egg bound and you don't know anything about that, a vet can help you, you know, see that if it ever happens again and hopefully help you out. Um, so now we talked about diseases that you can't really see. Now we're talking about things that can cause disease and just you never want to find. So creepy crawly things, lice, mites, um, stuff you never want to find, but we see all the time at shows and fairs. So lice on the left, they're kind of the bigger, creepy bugs. Mites, don't really see them with the naked eye, but little black dots that cause a lot of redness on birds. On the left, you'll see what lice eggs look like. So if you ever see feathers that have this hard white crust going up the feather stem, that's lice eggs. Those are really hard to get rid of. You never want to see those. It means you have a lot of lice going on in the flock. Mites, you'll also see they're crawling up the feathers, little black dots. They'll cause the redness around the skin. So always we want to teach people how to find these bugs. They're really hard to see, hard to find. You got to know where to look. Most people don't. Um, so biggest thing is check the vent. So the chicken's butt, you can see on the left here how to hold the chicken properly to check for this. Get a gold, good hold of the legs, support the, the front of the chicken because you don't want to hurt them. Um, and then you can spread the feathers and you can see, and typically that's where they hang out because there's a lot of warmth there. There's a lot of wetness, um, stuff that the bugs like to live on. You can also check underneath the wings. So your armpits basically of the bird, that's a really warm, safe place where the birds can't really get to. They can't see there. They can't really attack the bugs if they get them. And then, um, on the beard, the muff of the chicken, that's typically where we see the eggs a lot of times. So if you ever pet your chicken on the chin and it's really crusty. That's a sign of eggs. And unfortunately, the only way to get rid of that is by plucking. Um, and we'll kind of talk about that here in a second. Um, so yeah, treatment for these bird, these things is bathing. Um, if they have the eggs, you want to pluck them. You want to treat with permethrin if you ever see the live bugs, because that's the only re way to get rid of the live bugs. And so permethrin is just a insecticide, basically it comes in a duster spray and you kind of just powder the bug or the bird and then hopefully gets rid of them. But you always want to make sure you stick to the directions on the thing on the case because lice and things like in humans, they can become immune to the dust if you over apply and then you have basically super bugs on your birds. Um, another good trick is if you ever see bugs, you want to treat the birds and then you also need to treat the coops. So a lot of times I tell people all the time, if you have exposed one in your coops, you probably have bugs hanging out in there. You might have mice too, stuff like that. So if you treat your birds, you want to also treat the coop because if you're just going to treat the birds, you're going to put them back into a coop and you almost certainly have bugs in there as well. If you don't treat both of them. Last thing I'm going to talk about is nutrition. Um, 
So we always say to get a really high, complete food, you know, do look up stuff that has all the nutrition, all the things that your type of bird needs to live a healthy life. So if you have young birds, you want to get a food designated for them. If you have layers or if you have meat birds, depending on what you're raising, you want to make sure you get the right feed that has all the energy, the proteins, minerals for whatever your type of bird needs. Um, there's a lot of different feeds out there. You want to make sure you get one from a reputable source that tells you what is good for your birds. Um, you always want to supply your birds with fresh water day and night. So in the morning, check their water at night, check their water. If you use a nipple feeder or some kind of feeder that has stuff that the birds kind of have to activate, you always want to make sure those are clean and able to activate. Um, and then the biggest thing, especially with backyard flocks that we tell people is you really, really have to limit the treats on these birds. Um, so if you are giving them, you know, something that's not a normal high quality feed, maybe you're throwing a bunch of corn or seeds or something in there. We always recommend keeping that to a minimum because birds will pick and choose what their favorite things are. Just like humans, you know, if you have a bag of candy next to you and some broccoli, you're going to want to eat the candy. Um, and so in backyard flocks, a huge thing with them is they'll get fatty liver, they'll be overweight, and it can cause a lot of problems and sudden deaths in birds. So that's always something to really watch for is over treating your animals, you know, not just chickens, but dogs and cats and everything too, and even ourselves. And so this next part, I will hand it off to Emily to talk about some biosecurity. Hi, everybody. Um, like Ben said, my name is Emily, and I'm a second year veterinary student at CSU. Um, and this is going to be my second season helping out with the avian health team. Um, chickens are my favorite animal, so this is an absolute joy um, to do every summer. And I love talking about chickens and the importance of biosecurity. So um, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to put it in the chat. Um, I'll try to answer things as best I can. Um, but hopefully this presentation will, will uh, provide some pretty good information on what you guys can start doing um, to practice biosecurity in your flock. Um, so with biosecurity, um, we're talking uh, a lot about prevention of disease um, because when you think about it, um, if, if you have a bird that's sick, um, just reflect on how hard it is to find uh, veterinary care um, and somebody willing to look at individual birds. Um, it's really hard, right? Um, so unfortunately, once a bird gets sick, it's a lot harder to manage disease um, rather than just taking uh, an offensive approach and, and, um, and using good biosecurity practices. So yeah, next slide, please. Um, so like I said before, um, practicing good biosecurity means that you're doing everything you can to protect your birds from getting disease in the first place. Um, and I just want to do a quick plug for the Defend the Flock program. Um, it is uh, through the USDA. Um, and if you go to healthybirds.aphis.usda.gov, which is the little link um, at the bottom of the slide, they have really, really good resources for backyard flock owners. Um, and they tailor them to different age groups. So if you have um, different ages of kids, um, there are different resources so that everybody can get involved in keeping birds healthy. Um, so I'm gonna talk to you guys about four uh, specific things that you guys can do to keep your birds disease free. Um, and I'll go into detail about these in the upcoming slides, but those are all in all out flock management cleanliness, keeping species separate, and then purchasing birds from reputable sources. Uh, so the first thing is all in, all out flock management. Um, and so it's really, really hard uh, for, for backyard flocks and, and smaller, uh, smaller flocks to practice true all in, all out, which is um, getting uh, everybody, uh, one population of birds at the same age, and then just raising them through to production. Um, and so that, that is true all in all out management. Um, but there are different aspects of that, that you guys can apply to smaller farms and backyard flocks as well. So one of those is isolation of birds. And so that can be any, um, any birds that you or guys are bringing to shows and fairs, which are on pause right now, but might be applicable in the future for you. Um, so any birds that you had in your main flock that you brought out um, and then you're bringing back, you want to quarantine those um, before you put them back with your main flock, as well as any birds that you might 
have purchased um, at the shows and fairs or bird swaps, which I don't believe are going on right now either, um, because that's another really high, high risk um, meeting spot for a disease. But um, if you do purchase new birds from anybody, you want to make sure that you isolate those as well. So we recommend quarantining for a minimum of two weeks. Uh, that is just a, a minimum baseline. There really isn't a magic number um, in terms of, of length of time to quarantine. So we say, uh, you know, if you can quarantine them for longer than two weeks, um, it's probably uh, it's probably better. Um, a lot of the times birds hide illnesses really well. Ben did a really good job of talking about some of the clinical signs, but a lot of the times you'll just walk into your coop um, and everybody seemed to find the night before and then you'll find a bird that's sick and and um, yeah, because they're prey animals, it's, it's really easy for them to hide illnesses. Um, so uh, not only is it easy for them to hide um, when you're doing, you know, your initial decision to buy a bird or bring it back, but it also takes some time for diseases to develop. And so they might seem healthy when you, uh, when you first buy them or when you first bring them back to the show, but if they pick something up, it will take a couple of weeks for, for diseases to develop. So it's always better to be safe than sorry and, and separate those birds for a little while before you put them back with your main flock. Um, we recommend uh, keeping them a safe distance away from your main flock, uh, whether that be in a shed on your property or maybe an extra coop. Um, and if you guys don't have, um, any of those structures available, uh, keeping them in a garage, um, in like a kid's playpen or in a, in a kennel is also a good option. Um, and then the last thing about all in all out flock management is limiting dis uh, visitors to your flock. And so, you know, it, it's really cool, um, having birds and I always want to show off my birds to everybody. Um, but, but it's a really good way to spread diseases, especially if your friends also have birds. Um, it's just better to limit visitors to a minimum and then also consider um, keeping uh, other animals, uh, so your dogs and cats and your other pets, um, out of that flock. So when you think about, you know, taking your dog for a walk and, and playing in the park or going on a, on a hike for, with your dog, um, you know, you can change shoes and you can use foot baths, but you know, dogs don't wear shoes on hikes usually, and um, they will pick up a lot of things, um, you know, from wild birds uh, when you're out and about. And that can be another easy way that a lot of people don't necessarily consider um, for diseases to get in your flock. Um, so next, I'm going to talk to you guys about cleanliness. Um, so one of the main things and one of the easiest things that you guys can do is have clean designated coop clothes. Um, so the best, uh, thing, if you guys are going to do the minimum is to have clean washable rubber boots. Um, and those boots you should only be wearing, uh, right. You should put them on right before you enter your flock and then take them off immediately after. And you shouldn't wear those out and about running errands. And you should try not to wear shoes that you have worn out and about either hiking or going to feed stores or going to fairs. Um, you shouldn't wear those in your coop either. Um, if you wanted to up biosecurity a little bit more, um, especially considering avian influenza, you could also wear coveralls um, and then, you know, put those on before you go in and, and clean and interact with the birds and then take those off as well. Um, I always recommend uh, wearing a mask, especially when you're cleaning, um, just because of how hot and dusty Colorado gets, uh, as well as, you know, some of the um, Ammonia and moisture buildup can be a little bit irritating to your respiratory tract as well as the chicken's respiratory tract too. So having a mask to keep the dust and the ammonia out of your respiratory tract is always a good idea. Um, and then, you know, additionally, we did talk about the zoonotic potential for some of these diseases. So, you know, if you are um, a part of an immune compromised group um, or you're worried about AI in your flock, you know, it, it is never a bad idea to be extra safe, especially in light of our, our recent outbreak. Um, another thing to keep in mind is, is making sure that you're not sharing equipment between farms. Um, so, you know, the birds themselves can pass disease on, but, you know, a lot of these bacteria and viruses and, and parasites can stay out in the environment for quite a bit of time um, without having to live on a bird. And so, you know, your shoes is a really um, good example of how easily things can get tracked through um, to new flocks, but um, also, you know, equipment. So 
Um, I would try to avoid using other people's pitchforks or borrowing anything that's used to transport or get um, birds ready for fairs or shows. Um, even, you know, shampoo bottles, um, you know, dust uh, for mites and lice, those bottles can, can harbor, um, you know, bacteria and viruses and, and disease as well. So, you know, it's better to just keep your supplies to yourself, um, yeah, especially this year. Um, and then the last thing is just, you know, basic good husbandry. Um, you want to make sure you're regularly changing your bedding and your water um, and, and your food. Uh, I have chickens back in Connecticut when I'm, when I'm living there, and it is just so hard to keep their water clean because they always walk through it. But it's really important because if they don't have clean water and, and, and access to food um, that is uh, also cleaned and changed regularly, then, you know, they are they have a harder time uh, fending off viruses if they do get exposed. Um, and so it's also important to change bedding and keep that dry um, because, you know, if they are walking around with wet bedding, ammonia can build up and their, their respiratory tracts are a lot more sensitive than ours. So if you walk into a coop and, and your eyes start watering and you start sneezing or coughing, um, they are probably even more bothered than that. So um, making sure that dust is kept to a minimum, um, you know, and then also making sure that that there's not a lot of feces and, um, you know, moisture build up because that can also uh, introduce new problems like bumblefoot. Um, ben talked about Merrix a little bit. That's actually spread through uh, chicken dandruff uh, on their, you know, from their feather follicles. So um, that can really easily get into the dust and, and hang out there. So like I said, yeah, just minimizing dust, changing everything regularly, um, and, and keeping things clean, uh, from a husbandry perspective is also a really good idea. Um, the next thing that is also super important to consider, um, but is, is kind of hard in, in small backyard flocks, um, is keeping species separate. So, uh, it might be tempting if you're short on space to, to keep your waterfowl and your chickens um, or your turkeys all together. Uh, but as Ben mentioned a little bit in his portion of the PowerPoint, um, some species are more susceptible to some diseases than others. And so if you have a waterfowl, you know, they're actually a really good reservoir for uh, avian influenza. Um, but they might not actually show any clinical signs. So you might think your, your ducks are completely healthy, um, but unfortunately, if you put them with your chickens, they might um, pass, you know, avian influenza to your chickens without you even knowing that any of your birds were sick. Um, and then the same kind of goes for turkeys with mycoplasma. So chickens um, don't usually get super sick from mycoplasma compared to turkeys. Um, but, you know, if you put a chicken in that seems relatively healthy with a turkey, they could pass on um, that illness to turkeys and the turkeys could get really sick. And, and you might be a little bit confused why, because, you know, you're practicing good biosecurity, um, but sometimes these birds just don't act, act sick because they aren't as affected um, by these illnesses. Um, so the last thing that I guys want to talk to you guys about for biosecurity basics is purchasing birds from reputable sources. And so I think this is a little bit harder now um, with some states putting restrictions on. Um, that's actually a good thing in most cases because um, they're just keeping everybody safe and keeping transportation to a minimum right now. Um, but if you do want to purchase birds, uh, you know, this season, uh, you should consider the biosecurity practices of those facilities. Um, so, you know, whether or not they're letting people on their premise uh, that can be a little bit of a, a gray area um, because a lot of the times people with really strict biosecurity won't let you on your prem on their premise at all, um, or they'll you know make you put on boots um, or walk through a foot bath or put on boot covers, um, and that that is a really good sign. But if somebody's not letting you on their premise, it could also be a sign that maybe their biosecurity isn't up to snuff. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, usually, if they limit visitors. Uh, it's a it's a good sign. Um, you can also check websites for larger um, larger breeders and sellers and see what they're doing in terms of their biosecurity. Um, that's also a really good way to check and see if they vaccinate for Merix because, like Ben said, um, super prevalent in Colorado. And once a bird is infected, it is infected for life, and it does shed super contagious. So if it's in your flock already, 
and birds aren't vaccinated, they probably do have it. Um, and it just might be that they have, um, you know, permanent shedding and, and not any disease signs. And then those disease signs might present themselves eventually, but, um, yeah, a good way to check for vaccination as well. Um, and then you can also check and see if they are involved in any surveillance programs. So what we do all summer is certify people for the National Poultry Improvement Plan. Um, and so we do screen those fox regularly for uh, AI and also Salmonella pleurum typhoid. Um, and then they also have minimum biosecurity and husbandry um, standards that they have to comply with in order to pass inspections. So we do look in their coops, uh, make sure that everything's clean, make sure that they are, you know, changing food and water regularly, that they do have pretty um, good biosecurity protocols, um, and that their flock is, is free from disease. And another thing that is becoming a little bit more popular this year is getting an AI clean flock. And Ben can talk to you guys more about that if you have chickens and you're interested in doing that. Um, but those birds are swabbed for avian influenza. Um, and I believe samples are sent in every 180 days. Um, so that's another good way um, to make sure that those people actually um, care a lot about biosecurity and keeping disease out of their flocks. Um, and those are good people to buy from. Um, and then also just, you know, when you're, when you're looking at birds at fairs and, and swaps and, um, you know, other events, uh, it's good to keep in mind the appearance of the birds. Like I said, it can be really hard to tell healthy birds from sick birds. Um, you know, especially because birds hide illness really well. Um, and also it can take a few weeks for symptoms to manifest. But um, it's, it's just a general baseline, you know, does everybody look bright and alert and, and curious and aware of their environment? Um, are their ears and eyes um, and, you know, beak clean and, and free of discharge? Do they have a good weight? Um, you know, are they producing normal feces? These are all just things that you can kind of keep an eye out. Um, you can also check them for, for mites and lice too. Um, like Ben said, you know, check their, their beard and, and see if they have any live bugs on them as well. Um, this is just a little diagram that I made to show how easily um, disease can be spread just by your, your feet and your, you know, daily uh, equipment um, if you do not practice good biosecurity. Um, so, these are some of the places that you might frequent a lot other outside your premise. You know, you might go to a park or an open space and interact, um, you know, with wild birds and you can come into contact with their, you know, their feathers and their feces out, out and about when you're just walking around. Um, I don't know how many of you guys are, are from, you know, Fort Collins. I, I was looking at the chat before. It seems like everybody's from everywhere, but we have a big geese problem every year. Um, and there are just geese everywhere, even when you're walking around outside in the sidewalk. So it's super easy for you to unknowingly just walk through some manure and, and track um, disease back to your own flock if you're not good about switching out your footwear. Um, another place is the feed store. Um, so just think about how many people are coming in and out every day to buy food for their flocks. And so, you know, if everybody is not changing their shoes, then that is a really good way for people to pick up disease and bring that back to them, um, as well as for you to pick up things from their flocks and bring it back to your flock. Um, and, you know, they sell food for, for all types of poultry, not just chickens. And so, you know, you might be getting, uh, bringing back um, shoes that have been exposed to, um, you know, game birds or, or waterfowl or, or turkeys. And, you know, just keeping in mind that different birds are just, or different species are different, are susceptible to different, viruses like that's another um really important thing uh to be aware of and then you know the county fair or um swaps or shows are uh you know just a mixing pool of uh of just all different people from everywhere and another really good place to pick up disease just because you know those birds have been traveling they might be a little stressed and um so it's important to just make sure that you're you're changing out your shoes and you know, being as clean as possible when you're coming home, disinfecting um, and quarantining appropriately. And then that last little thing uh, on the bottom, right, is just, you know, a reminder not to share equipment um, and to be really careful when visiting other people's farms because, um, you know, if they have birds, 
uh, you know, that's just another way to bring back disease. Um, and then this is just one more reminder of the risks of salmonella. Um, you know, that might not be something that your birds get super sick with, um, depending on the type. Um, but that is something that can make you guys really, really sick. Um, especially if you're losing a lot of fluids because you have vomiting and diarrhea, um, it can get you dehydrated pretty quickly. You'll feel terrible. And, um, honestly, you know, it, it's not uncommon to have to be hospitalized, um, you know, for some of the more unpleasant symptoms. So we really want to make sure that you guys aren't exposing yourself unnecessarily to that. Um, so like I said, like, you know, you can, you can practice good hygiene for yourself, wash your hands after handling your birds. Um, you know, I even wear, you know, hats when I'm visiting flocks to keep, you know, dust and, and, um, and such out of my, my hair, um, making sure that, you know, you, you clean yourself up after, after, uh, you know, cleaning your coop and, and just not letting anybody kiss your birds because even though they're super cute, chickens are my favorite animal. Um, it's just really not a good idea. And then also, uh, you don't want to bring your birds into any, um, area of your house where you might be prepping food. Um, that's generally not best practice either. Um, so not super relevant this year, um, maybe towards the end of the summer, maybe not, but, um, so for fairs and shows or any event where you are transporting birds from your flock, um, you just really want to make sure that the birds that you're bringing to these events, um, are healthy. If you have any sort of doubt about, um, about the health status of any of your birds, just leave them at home. It's much better just to be safe um, and err on the side of caution uh, rather than risk bringing something to a show um, where things get spread so easily. Um, so like Ben was saying before, you wanna check for respiratory illnesses. Um, and that I think I saw a, a question in the chat about AI symptoms. So these are some of the AI symptoms that you could look out for facial swelling, um, ocular and nasal discharge, uh, if they're you know, having a really hard time gasping for breath, um, you know, and then it's also uh, a good idea to look in their mouth for plaques and birds might not like that, but if you're handling them regularly, it's actually a good idea to kind of mess around with them because it makes them a lot more docile um, for, for handling when you're, when you're bringing them to shows and such. So it's actually a, a good idea to kind of pick up your birds every so often and, you know, take a, take a good look at them. Um, and then like Ben said before, lice and mites, it's a bane of our existence. We hate, um, you know, when we're inspecting birds at shows and everything looks really good. And then we look under the wing or under, you know, around the vent area and then we see some creepy crawlies and it's, it's such a bummer to send people home, but sometimes we have to do that. Um, if, if the parasite load is, is too high. Um, so one thing that you guys can do is kind of start, um, uh, working towards eliminating, those bugs from your from your birds about a month before the show so you should give them a good wash uh, you should pluck any eggs that you see out and then you should dust them and then you should repeat that process a week before the show and then right before the show and you're you're, you're giving them their normal bath and yeah just do that once over uh last minute and then if there are any sort of you know parasites on them still uh it's probably best to leave them home And so same thing, uh, you should uh, keep some pretty uh, stringent biosecurity after you bring those birds back. Like I said, it's a good idea to quarantine for at least two weeks um, and then quarantine any new birds as well. Um, and then, you know, you did all of that hard work to prep your bird and make sure that it's lice and mite free before the show. But, you know, sometimes one of those bugs just gets through um, no matter how many birds we inspect and, um, it's, it's always a good idea to, to wash and dust them afterwards too, just to be safe. Um, so these are some of the things that uh, I recommend doing if your birds do get sick. Um, so if you're, you know, you're doing all the right things and you're quarantining, um, then they should be away from your other birds. Um, if you notice any sick birds in your flock, you should isolate those immediately as well. Um, so the first thing that you guys should do is, is just remove them from the rest of the flock, quarantine them somewhere. Um, and then it's also really, really important to, uh, record keep, especially if you are reaching out to, 
um, your poultry leaders. So that could be, you know, the local veterinarian, if they see poultry, it could be your 4-H leader. Um, it could be us. Uh, we're always a good research and our resource and our uh, contact information will be, you know, at the end of this presentation, if you, if you do have questions, but um, a lot of the time we'll need records of, you know, when the disease started and, and kind of the signs and how the signs progressed over time and um, how many birds maybe have died and how quickly, um, because that gives us a good idea of how contagious um, it is. So if it's being spread from bird to bird, or if maybe it's an environmental or like a management thing um, and, and kind of gives us a better idea of what tests are on, uh, if birds are still alive or um, what to look for on necropsy uh, if, if birds have died. So um, record keeping is great. Um, you know, always happy to take your calls and emails. Uh, we do some diagnostic testing and also necropsies, which basically means that we are looking at the birds that have died. Um, taking samples and kind of figuring out what happened, um, what went wrong, and if there is any sort of cause for concern, uh, concern with contagions. Um, and then one last thing I wanted to uh, mention that I, I failed to do during the biosecurity portion um, is just a reminder that um, another thing that you can do um, is, is put a footpath on your property. Um, so, you know, boots and, and coveralls are great, but uh, adding a footpath, so just you know, something uh, filled with water that you can walk through that's also filled with, uh, that also has disinfectant in it is another really good way um, to make sure that you're stepping into your um, flock without any um, sort of disease being tracked in on your shoes. Um, so that's another really important thing uh, to keep in mind. Um, you know, we can use bleach and then there are some livestock specific disinfectants like Burkhan. Um, but it's also important to check that regularly because Colorado gets so dry um, and it can get dried out pretty quickly. And then also um, sunlight can kind of deactivate some of those uh, antimicrobial uh, and disinfectant properties. So just make sure that you're changing that regularly too. Um, but that's the last thing that I wanted to add. Um, and then just a reminder, uh, you guys are the best production your birds can have. Um, prevention truly is the best medicine uh, for uh, flocks and other herd animals. Um, it's really hard to treat uh, treat chickens once, once there is disease in the flock. So just keep in mind some of the things we talked to you guys about today and, and feel free to reach out with any other questions as well um, as they come up. So yeah, that's just our contact information. Um, that's the avian health hotline number. And then you can also email us uh, we've got Heather's contact information up there and then also Ben's and my contact information as well. Um, like I said, I'm a vet student. So, you know, if any of you guys are considering a career in veterinary medicine, I'm also happy to talk to you guys about that as well. Um, right now I'm in the middle of finals. And so if I look exhausted, it's because I am. Um, and so maybe wait until after finals for, for the vet veterinary questions. But um, yeah, that's my email. Um, it's actually spelled incorrectly on the slides, but uh, it, it's just, it should be my last name. So just add an O after that B um, if you want to reach out. Perfect. Thank you, guys. We, we appreciate you getting on this evening. Um, it looks like I see specifically one question in the chat from, from Heather. She was asking about um, when she said when they do testing before the birds go into fair, we usually don't get the results for months. Um, how long does it normally take to get results on testing? <laughs> uh, I, I don't know why it takes months. Usually for a lot of birds, the fair ones take a little bit longer because we're doing such a high volume, but honestly, we usually know within the week. Um, once it gets past the testing, it's out of my hands and they have to, someone else releases the results. Um, I don't know why it takes so long, but it's just a slow process. But in general, we will usually know within the first week. And if anything ever comes back positive, you'll usually know sooner. Um, so no news is a lot of times almost better news. 
Ben, this is Callie in Albert County, and, and both you and Emily come to our fair regularly, and thank you guys so much. But I just want to echo that, right? Like, if you don't hear about it for months, that's a great thing. Yeah, so, I was like, if you don't hear from us and your chickens yeah, are still alive, that's, that's a good probably. sign. Yeah, so I, I think that's probably just a, a hang-up probably on extension or fair word side of it because you guys have always been super responsive, you know, for us if there's been a suspect or anything like that. So it's just, you know, no news is good news for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Quick question for you guys. Just in extension world, we get a lot of questions about the use of DE and more of the holistic side of, of treatments, apple cider vinegar, things like that. Can you kind of just touch on that from the, the veterinary or the diagnostic side of things? Uh, yeah. So the DE, the, the Dionysius earth, is that right? Right. Something like that. I don't know if I said that right, but um, <laughs> Earth, is that how it's pronounced? That's how I always have, but I, I yeah, know. I know. I was, I was like, <laughs> mixed up in head. but yeah, so that one is, it's not proven to be like actually effective. Um, it's not something that's harmful to do in any way, but it's not necessarily going to solve the issues. Um, so, you know, if it's not something that you shouldn't try, but if it pers a problem persists, you definitely want to seek out other alternatives, even if it isn't a holistic approach. Um, I have heard a lot of good things about the apple cider vinegar tricks. Um, we do have some commercial producers who actually use that in their own um, flocks. So flocks of, you know, 20,000 birds, they'll implement a system which feeds it into their watering systems. So I've actually heard a lot of good things about that. Um, people have all sorts of different you know, electrolyte things or various water supplements that they can use. Um, so definitely, you know, it, it's not a bad idea. Definitely make sure you're doing it right though. If you use it, don't, you know, you don't want to overload them with something. Um, so definitely do your research before you use those things, but yeah, it's definitely, it's, it's a good thing to use based on what we hear from people. Is there, uh, when you guys are talking about cleaning out um, pens and barns and things like that, especially because dust, especially in poultry barns, and, and especially a lot of people have older poultry barns, um, what, do you have any recommendations as far as bedding types or what to do as far as dust control? Emily, do you have, I mean, you have the, the use of actually like, yeah, I mean, it, it's a lot harder out here, I think. Um, the most common bedding that I just see is is the, the pine shavings. Um, and I would say just making sure that it, it does get changed regularly and that there's, there's good ventilation, um, which, you know, might not be applicable for this year if, if you're keeping birds inside. But um, I, I found that the longer you leave it in there, um, the more it gets kind of broken down and, and a lot dustier. Um, I also feel like, you know, just going around and removing all, all the cobwebs, you know, as often as, as you can, um, is also a good, good practice. Um, I do like the annual, well, semi-annual uh, sweep in my barn where I just like, you know, take all the cobwebs off and, and kind of do like a really good clean out um, and kind of sweep it. But depending on people, the sizes of people's coops, that might not be possible. I would just say trying to do like, you know, a good thorough cleaning, um, you know, as, as often as you can. Um, and then, you know, supplement with like spot cleaning um, or, you know, just uh, a, a quicker change uh, every so often. It, it, it's just, it, it is, it's a lot harder in Colorado. Um, and there's no, there's no magic solution, unfortunately, but, you know, basic good husbandry and, and frequent cleaning, I, I found tends to help. Yeah, to kind of add on to that, we have heard some, some people have good luck with maybe they'll, if they have the means, you put either some kind of like, concrete flooring underneath or you get the um I, I don't know what it's called but it's kind of like a plastic tarp basically 
Um, and you can have that kind of on the bottom and then put the pine shavings or whatever litter you have on top of that. And that sometimes can make for really easy, easy cleaning too. And you can kind of pull the whole thing out, you know, power wash and disinfect, um, and then put it back. Um, sometimes that can help with dust because obviously Colorado is so dry that dust is just all the time. Um, but yeah, it's definitely just regular cleaning is probably the best thing to minimize dust.